Um, I'd first like to welcome everybody and to ask you to mute yourselves if you're already not muted. I'm so glad that so many, many of you are interested in our presentation today. The coronavirus has caused all of us to change the ways in which we live and work and interact. We hope it can be brought under control soon. But in the meantime, we are very fortunate to have this wonderful Zoom capability, which makes it possible for us to see and talk with each other, even though we can't do it in person. Uh, as you all may have gathered, this, this is our first time hosting a Zoom session. So hope you all will cut, cut me some slack. We'll continue to hold our monthly presentations in the Zoom format as long as it is necessary. And I wanted quickly to mention that ESU headquarters has been offering a stellar series of ESU happy hours. They are on a variety of fascinating topics. The one this afternoon at four is on Shakespeare, scandals and, scandals and scoundrels. It even comes with a suggested libation to drink while you're enjoying the program. <laughs> the next one in September is on Downton Abbey in the kitchen. <clears throat> These are wonderful presentations and we strongly encourage all of you to watch them. Please look at the ESU website to find more details on them and on other activities which New York is organizing. And now Susan will tell you about our speaker and the fascinating topic on which he will speak. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, it is nice to be here. Uh, for a minute there, I wasn't sure I would be <laughs> when the link didn't work. However, um, I, like you and all our members, are delighted that we are able to present this program today. Um, you know, we had scheduled the same program last May to be a part of the Derby Day or the Derby Day celebrations. However, uh, COVID uh, changed all that. We had hoped perhaps um, that uh, all of that would be a bad memory by September when this program was rescheduled. Um, but since that wasn't the case, we're, as Eleanor said, we're just absolutely delighted that we're able to bring um, this to our members, this program uh, being presented by James Beckwith. James has, um, a background in law. Um, he is originally from Warrington, North Carolina. He went to the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and then on to uh, the University of Chicago Law School. And he taught commercial law at the University of North Carolina Central University for a number of years. He recently retired and uh, lives in Durham. And he has presented um, this program a number of times. And we're absolutely thrilled that he is going to present it today. I'm sure you're going to like it very, very much. Um, and learn really um, how the first sporting event to capture the imagination of our early republic um, began. So with that, I will just turn it over to Jim. And Jim, I just want to thank you again for, for being so um, willing to take this opportunity um, because it is a new experience presenting a program on Zoom. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you and uh, you can take it from here. Okay, Jim, I've just unmuted you. Um, Josh, I, I can't see him, so how can I um, um, pull up his video? Um, so he should now begin the screen sharing, as we discussed. So um, I know that he just muted himself, but unfortunately he's muted again. So Jim, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna try to unmute you again. Uh, make sure you go to that bottom left-hand corner and uh, click the uh, unmute button. Okay, am I back? You are back. We can hear you. Now, if you want to begin the screen share yep. uh, for your presentation, you should be all set for that. Screen share, and then the next step is the little... Uh, yep, yeah. that's it.
Okay. There we go. Perfect. See you just fine. All right. I appreciate everyone's patience and as we deal with technology covering half the country. And uh, I'm delighted to be in New Bern, sort of. And uh, let me get. Now the PowerPoint is up. Um, I do want to give uh, people my email address. You can just write it down. I'll mention it at the end so that I can send you the text of this talk if you want it. My email address is James P. Beckwith, B E C K W I T H, at gmail.com. And uh, I'll tell you again at the end of the talk. I do this so uh, once at a talk, I think up in Virginia, someone said, oh, I'm gonna take notes. And I said, well, it's not necessary because I'll send you the text. So just relax and listen. And if you'll send me your email address, I'll send you a PDF or a Word file of everything you're going to hear. There's one disadvantage to this virtual presentation I usually hand out in person a genealogical chart that shows you the descendants down to several grandchildren of Diamond, the English racer. This story and the great match race of 1823 involves a family of horses. So there is this, it would help if you had a genealogical chart. But I will, as I go through and talk about the horses, then I'll remind you of how they are related. So let's just relax and roll with the punches as we deal with this virtual world we're in right now. And just sorry to interrupt you, but I just wanted to make a, just a brief announcement that if during the presentation you have any questions you'd like to ask Jim on the content, uh, there is a chat module, a box that you can hit. There is a button if you're using the desktop version at the bottom that says chat. There's already a little note in there that I left in there, but if you want to enter any questions in there via text, Jim will address them at the end of the presentation. Sorry to interrupt, Jim. Go ahead. Well, I appreciate it, Josh, and I'm scared to death that my, my computer is going to send me some sort of Windows update and shut me down even though I did not intend it. So let's just hope that doesn't happen. All right, um, and so I'll be working my PowerPoint slides as the talk begins. All in the family, Diomed, Sir Archie, and Henry, from the Epsom Derby of 1780 to the great match race of 1823. By the skin of our teeth, Diomed and Castianira, the Epsom Derby began as a celebration following the first running of the Oaks Stakes in 1779. Edward Smith Stanley, the 12th Earl of Derby, and there he is looking very posh, and Sir Charles Thomas Bunbury wanted to create a new race of three-year-olds for the enjoyment of their friends. The race was to be named either the, for the host Derby or his guest, Bunbury. Legend suggests that the name was decided by the toss of a coin. The inaugural running was held on Thursday, May 4th, 1780, and was won by Diamond, a colt owned by Bunbury. Bunbury, a steward of the jockey club, collected prize money of a thousand pounds. Across the Atlantic, a revolutionary war was fought to its conclusion. Diamond was a bright chestnut standing 15 hands three inches high and would go on to win 10 more races in succession. After many races, Diamond was allowed to rest. Sadly, when he returned to racing, he was not the same horse. His wins became erratic and Bunbury decided to retire Diamond to stud. His initial stud fee was five guineas. Few people were interested 
and over the next 10 years, his fees declined. At the age of 21 in 1798, his fee was only two guineas. With no takers, the aging stallion grazed alone. From newly independent Virginia, however, fortune smiled on Diamond. When Diamond was offered for sale by Bunbury, John Holmes of Bowling Green in Virginia bought him for the bargain price of $250. Soon Diamond had crossed the ocean and was living at Caroline County at Holmes's farm. Holmes was a major figure in the cultivation of American bloodstock. You can see this advertisement. Fortunately, Holmes and his partner, John Taylor, ignored the advice of their agent, James Weatherby, who had described Diamond as a bad foal getter. Diamond was returned to stud in Virginia in 1798, and his arrival and availability were soon advertised in Virginia papers. Holmes wrote to his friend John Taylor about his enthusiasm for Diamond. I wish you could see Diamond. I think him the finest horse I ever saw. He is much admired by everyone who has seen him. But then a year later in 1799, Holmes sold Diamond to Thomas Goode and Miles Selden for a thousand pounds Virginia money. In the years that followed, Diamond proved to be a great success as his get began to win more and more races. About this time, Taylor was interested in importing horses of his own. He was assisted by his English agents, James Clark and James Weatherby. As James Clark looked for horses in England, word reached John Taylor that Clark has since fallen in love with a Rockingham filly owned by Mr. Popham. Castian Ira, was by the famous Rockingham out of Tabitha. James Weatherby made a more cautious assessment. While he approved of Castian Ira, whose sire and dam were of the King Herod line, he was guarded in writing that she was rather high upon the leg, and when in training I would be afraid will be light and leggy. Taylor followed Clark's advice and bought Castian Ira for 105 pounds. Castian Ira was sent on board the Tyne to Virginia and was accompanied by her groom, Thomas Larkin. The northern neck of Virginia is a very special place of isolated pastoral beauty. The neck extends down between the Potomac and Rappahannock rivers from Fredericksburg to Kilmarnock and other towns on the Chesapeake Bay. Mount Airy was constructed by John Taylor III and his wife, Rebecca Plater, on a high ridge on the north bank of the Rappahannock River. It was built in the style of a Palladian villa. The central block of the house is flanked by offset wings. The house was constructed of brown northern neck sandstone, embellished with buff colored stone trim from Aquia Creek in Stafford County. Terrace gardens, a deer park, and a racetrack surrounded the house. Not a successful racer, Castian Ira was put to breeding. In the spring of 1804, Archibald Carey Randolph, known as Archie, and John Taylor III bought, brought Castian Ira to Selden's farm, Tree Hill. There she was chosen to be bred to Diamond, age 27 in his seventh American season at Stud. Castian Ira was accompanied by her English trainer, Thomas Larkin. An African-American groom named Nat came from Ben Lomond. They were joined by J.M. Selden, a son of Tree Hill's owner. These three witnesses would long remember this day. Happily, 11 months later in May, 1805, Castian Ira gave birth to a fine colt who was destined for immortality. He was most likely born at Ben Loman, Randolph's home on the James River in Goochland County. A dark bay, he had a white patch 
on his right hind pastern, the lower leg above the hoof. We have thus, we've come thus far by the skin of our teeth. History is always contingent to those who live through it, the result never being inevitable. Hindsight should never leave one to think that a historical result was certain. In our case, but for the discerning eye of James Clark and his love for Castianira, we would have no tale to tell. Sir Archie, the foundation sire. Burdened with debts, Archie Randolph sold, gambled, or gave away his share in the colt to Taylor. The colt was sent to Mount Airy in 1807. Randolph wrote to Taylor, I have sent our fine colt for you to take and do as you please. I am not able to do him that justice such a horse is entitled to. He is thought to be the best colt that is anywhere. Larkin says the finest two-year-old he ever saw. Mr. Wormley will inform you what are his engagements, any part of which you may take. I have named him Robert Burns, under which name he is entered. As the full owner of the colt, Taylor soon decided not to keep little Robert Burns and traded him to Wormley in exchange for a, way, for a mayor. But Taylor made a parting gift to his friend. He gave the colt a new name, Sir Archie, in honor of Archie Randolph. In Sir Archie's third year on April 15, 1808, the great Sire Diamond died at the age of 31. The previous year, his 30th, had been his last season at Stud. As the proven great America foal getter in his last years, Diamond's death caused widespread mourning. He was later called by one writer the most important of all horses. Thomas Goode buried the patriarch at a spot overlooking the Appomattox River. So I'm gonna digress and remind you that this talk is all about the descendants of the great diamond. And Sir Archie is one of those sons and we will be talking ultimately about grandchildren of diamond. Ralph Wormley decided to get out of the racing business and advertise several horses for sale, including Sir Archie. Sir Archie had run several races and caught the eye of William Ransom Johnson, age 26. Johnson was born in 1782 in Warren County, North Carolina. From an early age, he had a great interest in horse racing and developed a keen eye for horses and their potential. He saw that Sir Archie, though unproven, had much to offer and bought him for $1,500. And I might add, that um, William Ransom Johnson grew up near Warrington at the Marmaduke Johnson house that happily is being maintained to this day. Warren County, Sir Archie's new home, lay just across the border from the Old Dominion. With nearby Halifax and Northampton, these border, three border counties formed the heart of the Roanoke Valley. With a distinct plantation society, the Roanoke Valley differed from the Piedmont and mountain regions of the rest of North Carolina. Instead of small farms with few or no slaves, large plantations supported schools and shops in the county seat of Warrington. In the words of Henry W. Lewis, Warrington was a town of merchants, lawyers, and teachers. In this early federal period, beautiful houses of the Montmorency School were being constructed. And in sport, the racing and breeding of horses were becoming wildly popular, and Warrington was no exception. William Ransom Johnson lived on the southern edge of Warrington with the Halifax Stage Road running between his house and the town. His wife, Mary Evans Johnson, was the daughter of Dr. George Evans of Oakland, a Virginia plantation located about 18 miles from Petersburg on the Appomattox River in Chesterfield County. 
By his second season in 1809, Sir Archie was beginning to win and he would continue to win. In the fall, he ran against Wrangler owned by Miles Selden, the owner of Diamond, in the Jockey Club purse at Richmond. The last race Sir Archie ran was at Scotland Neck against a horse owned by General William R. Davy. In late 1809, Johnson sold Sir Archie to William R. Davy for $5,000. Johnson gave Davy a famous letter stating, I have only to say that in my opinion, Sir Archie is the best horse I ever saw. He also offered to bet $5,000 on Sir Archie in four mile heats against any horse in the world. General Davy was a lawyer, planter, distinguished Revolutionary War officer and former governor of North Carolina who was instrumental in the creation of the university. A leading Federalist, he was often in opposition to his Halifax neighbor, Wiley Jones, leader of the Anti-Federalists. He had been married to Sarah Jones, a daughter of Alan Jones of Mount Gallant, and thereby a niece of Wiley Jones. Living in Halifax at a house called Loretta, he had become part of the social life of the Roanoke Valley with its love of horse racing. Living in South Carolina as a widower at his plantation, Tivoli, Davy missed many of the comforts of life that he had enjoyed at Halifax. Regarding horses, Davy had a definite view of horse breeding. In a letter to his friend, John Steele, Davy agreed with Steele that a man who breeds horses should do it with a view to profit only. Of course, Davy was an astute judge of horses in buying the four-year-old Sir Archie, but he did not keep him long. Davy was in the process of disposing of his North Carolina properties, and he gave New Hope Plantation near Halifax and Sir Archie to his oldest son, Alan Jones Davy, namesake of his material grandfather. Alan Davy, 24, was born in Halifax County in 1785. He was already a well-known importer and breeder of horses. In December 1809, Davy was advertising Sir Archie's stud services in the Raleigh Minerva. On January 18, 1810, Davy advertised in the P Petersburg Intelligencer that the celebrated racer Sir Archie will stand at New Hope two miles out of the town of Halifax, NC, the ensuing season to cover mares at $40 the season. As a racer or blood horse, Sir Archie is inferior to no horse ever bred or trained in this or any country. The younger Davy also quoted Johnson's letter to General Davy and his wager of $5,000 on Sir Archie against any horse. So Archie's fee of $40 was high for an unproven sire. His own sire diamond had stood in his last season at $50 the season. In February 1810, Sir Archie began his career as a sire. Some aspects of horse breeding may seem indelicate to a modern audience. First, teasers were used to excite the mare. After prancing and flirting with the mare, the hapless teaser, usually of undistinguished racing history, was led away. Sir Archie was then given an easy introduction to his receptive partner. Second, inbreeding was the usual practice. For example, William Ransom Johnson paid his $40 and sent over to New Hope uh, for Warrington, Miss Monroe, a full sister of Sir Archie. And I'll digress, a lady at the Deep Run Hunt in Virginia told me that she thought inbreeding resulted from a lack of knowledge of genetics and a thought that if two closely related horses had the same characteristic, you would breed them. And that would, in, that will double, that would increase the desired characteristic. But they didn't realize the possible negative effects. In this first year, 
Sir Archie was profitable for Alan Jones Davy, but Davy was not proficient in managing his financial affairs. While he was personally charming, he was not an efficient manager and was fond of gambling. To raise needed funds, Davy began to lease Sir Archie. Sir Archie was leased by Johnson in the season of 1811. So Sir Archie was in Warrington, just as his <clears throat> first get from 1810 were being born. For the season of 1812, Sir Archie was in Virginia leased by William Edward Broadnax of Obscurity Plantation in Brunswick County. Broadnax was a great horseman and uh, in his collection had one of the early stud books by Edgar. In his advertisement, again in the Petersburg Intelligencer, Broadnax announced that Sir Archie was in high condition and would stand at his stable. Because of the War of 1812, Broadnax conceded that as times are different, difficult and money scarce, he will be let to mares by the season at the reduced price of $25. In the 1813 season, Sir Archie was back at New Hope. On November 14, 1813, Archie Randolph, whose name had been given to his namesake by John Taylor, died in Frederick, now Clark County, Virginia at Carter Hall, the home of his father-in-law, Nathaniel Burrell. Randolph's death occurred just as his namesake reputation as a foal getter was getting, becoming more and more lustrous. For five years, Alan Jones Davy had lived and gambled beyond his means. Unable to pay his debts, Davy had to sell everything, including New Hope and Sir Archie. William Amos, in a deal bill of sale dated October 25th, 1814, took Sir Archie in settlement of his debt. Sir Archie then moved east from Halifax County across the Roanoke River to Northampton and the Amos Stable at Mofield. Mofield stands north of Highway 158, about four miles west of Jackson. The house was built for William Amos about 1796. It has been suggested that the house was built by William Say, but then vigorous dissent, there is a great debate about the houses and the WH furniture and William Say. And the scholars are taking diametrically opposite positions on this. So I will say nothing more about that. The house was built in 1796. The main house is one room deep with an L extended behind the left section of the porch. The hip roof of the house is supported by a full width double portico front porch. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of the house are the porch's upper and lower Doric columns. These columns are actually one column it rises from the first floor through the second floor and then supports the cornice of the roof extending from the front of the house. The design features of Mofield are shared by other houses in the area, possibly constructed by William Say. Of particular note are the sawtooth moldings at the top and then the inverted demi-lune patterns in the middle uh, floor section of the upper porch. Today, Mofield, beautifully maintained, stands in splendid isolation, but was once the center of a plantation community. This was the Mofield that Sir Archie knew and where he lived out the remainder of his life. Henry, the third generation. We're now looking at a grandchild of Diamond. A small notice appeared on page three of the weekly Raleigh Register for July 4th, 1803. On the 22nd ultimate, Lemuel Long, Esquire of Halifax to Miss Polly Amos, only daughter of William Amos Esquire of Northampton County. Lemuel Long was the son of Colonel Nicholas Long of Quonky near Halifax, who like William Amos had been an officer in the North Carolina and Continental Line during the Revolutionary War. Mary Amos knew Mofield well 
having spent her teenage years there following its 1796 construction. The couple built a Greek revival house called Chantilly, sadly demolished not too long ago. As a married lady, Mary Amos Long came to know Sir Archie at her father's house. Lemuel and Mary Long were interested in horse breeding. His marriage and ge uh, geographic proximity to Mofield made a match with Sir Archie a natural choice. In 1818, Sir Archie was bred to his half-sister, a mare by Diamond out of Bellona. Their colt Henry, grandson of Diamond, was foaled on June 17, 1819 at Chantilly. The Gathering Storm. Uh, an aside, you can't talk about the history of the American thoroughbred without the historical context of what was happening in the sectional crisis. What events led to the great match race of 1823? Any discussion of horse racing must also discuss the underlying sectional di division that was growing in America. Only 47 years since independence, the age Thomas Jefferson and John Adams were still living. After the War of 1812, the country was expanding to the South and West, adding states such as Florida and Mississippi to the South and Illinois and Indiana to the West. This expansion reflected the continuing differences over slavery among the states. 1820 brought the Missouri Compromise in the election of James Monroe to a second term. By the terms of the Missouri Compromise, Missouri was admitted as a slave state and slavery was prohibited west of the Mississippi River, north of the southern boundary of Missouri. Diamond's descendants were distinguishing themselves north and south. In the north, much was happening. American eclipse a grandson of Diamond by Duroc was foaled in 1818. By 18, by eight, was foaled in 1814. By 1818, Eclipse began to run three mile heats. On March 15, 1819, American Eclipse was sold to Cornelius W. Van Ranst of New York. By 1819, American Eclipse was winning easy victories at all distances in New York. With his undefeated record, Southerners began to notice this Northern star. So here we have another grandson of Diamond, Badu Rock, American Eclipse. In the South, the get of Sir Archie were triumphant. Sir Charles, a son of Sir Archie, was foaled in 1816. A sturdy chestnut, he resembled his sire. He was high in the withers and strong in the well-sloped shoulders. Well-proportioned, clean, and powerful and before and behind, wrote one writer. Sir Charles was widely successful in races against the best horses in the South. In the North, in New York, the sport of horse racing faced turbulent times. In 1820, the New York Association for the Improvement of the Breed of Horses was founded by Van Ranst and John Cox Stevens. With its association with gambling and disorder, racing had been illegal since 1802. Racing was, however, legalized in 1821. As a result, in 1821, in what is now Woodhaven, Queens, in New York City, the Union Race Course was opened. Union featured a skinned dirt track, which was a novelty for the time. Unlike the English grass courses, the dirt track was fast, and Union became the model for future American racetracks. In 1822, in keeping with Sir Charles and his many successes in the South, where racing was always legal, a challenge appeared in the New York newspapers. James J. Harrison of Brunswick County, Virginia, offered to run Sir Charles against American Eclipse over the Washington courts, course, four mile heats agreeable to the rules of the course for five or $10,000. Van, 
Van Rantz promptly accepted the offer for the larger amount of 10,000. The forfeit money of 5,000 was deposited and the date of November 2nd was selected for the two first cousins to meet. Sir Charles, grandson of Diamond, and American Eclipse, grandson of Diamond. The Washington course was located near present-day 14th Street below Columbia Heights. At the appointed hour, both horses were brought out and the mount riders mounted. The large and lively crowd eagerly awaited the start, but then Harrison approached the judges' stand. Instead of running according to the challenge, Harrison told the judges that Sir Charles had met with an accident, injuring a tendon. Harrison stated he would pay the forfeit money. He did not, however, want to disappoint the spectators. Harrison offered to bet $1,500 on Sir Charles for a single heat against Eclipse. The horses started off at the starting signal. Eclipse captured the lead. His first cousin kept close behind, apparently holding off for a fast close at the finish. Three times around they race, and Sir Charles gave his best effort. It was in vain. His left leg f failed him, and he quickly faded to a limping halt. Eclipsed, unchallenged, cantered in as the easy winner. The heat and the $1,500 had been won. The loud applause for Eclipse <clears throat> from northern hands in the crowd sounded of sectional pride and of a growing enmity. The southerners from North Carolina and Virginia could barely contain their disappointment. The contest between Sir Charles and Eclipse, however, turned out to be only a dress rehearsal, or perhaps more aptly, a first skirmish in a larger conflict. At the jockey club following that race, the Southerners, including William Ransom Johnson and John Randolph of Roanoke, were adamant. They were determined to not take defeat lightly. Johnson, having left North Carolina about 1818, was living at Oakland near Petersburg, his wife's home. He offered to produce a horse on the last Tuesday in May 1823 to run the four mile heats against Eclipse over the Union course on Long Island for $20,000 a side. As one writer described it, overflowing with youth, ardor, and gallantry, John C. Stevens immediately rose at the table to answer the suggestion from the Southerners and accepted the challenge. The offer was literally Eclipse against the world. The Great Match Race of 1823. Under the leadership of John C. Stevens, the New Yorkers formed a committee to raise the needed $20,000. Stevens contributed 6,000 and Van Rantz, the owner of Eclipse, made a large contribution. John Livingston, a kinsman of Stevens, and Michael Burnham, publisher of the New York Post, contributed as did 14 others. In Virginia, William Ransom Johnson formed his own syndicate. Now look at that face. Among the contributors were John Randolph of Roanoke, whose eccentricities were legion, and Otway P. Hare. As he was known as the Napoleon of the turf, Johnson was naturally to be in charge of the selection and training of the horses. With a sense of the dramatic, Johnson proposed to train five horses, but he would wait until the very day of the race to announce the chosen horse to start. To no one's surprise, Johnson chose three sons, one daughter, and a grandson of Sir Archie. They would race in the months leading up to Johnson making his final selection. In early May, 1823, Johnson and Arthur Taylor left Petersburg with the five horses. Out of an abundance of a caution to avoid injuries, they traveled by water. Down the James River, they proceeded. 
then up the coast to the Delaware River. They traveled to the home of Johnson's friend, Bella Badger near Philadelphia. American Eclipse was already in training on Long Island at the Union course. At Badger's estate, final training began on May 15. Two of the five horses never made it to New York. John Richards cut his foot on a rock and was retired to the stable. Washington also was dropped from contention, leaving only three horses for Johnson's judgment. Anticipation of the contest was growing. From the South, fully 20,000 spectators traveled north in what resembled a migration. Among those making their way to the north was William Pretty Billy Williams, of Montmorency, a magnificent federal house built near Shaco Creek in southern Warren County, North Carolina. He had been a neighbor of William Ransom Johnson before Johnson moved to Virginia. Pretty Billy wrote to his wife, Melissa, from Philadelphia. I shall leave here today at 12 o'clock for New York and the races. Two of Mr. Johnson's horses are lame and have been left in this neighborhood. He has gone off with three and the race will most certainly run if the New Yorkers do not back out. As the race day approached, the landscape was transformed, the atmosphere electric. Everyone knew of the quality of the race. One English commentator was succinct in describing the American thoroughbred of the time. All the best horses in the Northern states are by Duroc and in the Southern states by Sir Archie. In a word, all the best horses in America descended from these two sons of Diamond. And among these best were Duroc's son Eclipse and Sir Archie's three get brought by Johnson. A Washington paper was concerned enough to suggest that the passions unleashed at the race might threaten the Missouri Compromise. So it was indeed the North versus the South in an epic American contest. On Monday, May 22nd, Johnson arrived at the Union course with Henry, Betsy Richards, and Flying Childers. As the horses walked the track, Johnson and Van Rand shook hands. Neither man divulged his own secret, the chosen Southern horse, nor the chosen Northern jockey. Soon after, Johnson assembled his entourage and announced that Henry from Halifax, North Carolina would run for the South. It was a popular choice. John Walden, a white Virginian who had a bond with Henry, knew that the choice meant that he would be riding. The younger, less experienced jockey, enslaved Charles Stewart, knew that he would ride in other races at other times. Johnson then discussed tactics for the race with Walden. And I'm gonna digress here. Charles Stewart made an appearance at this race and he has lived a remarkable life. And after the Civil War, he dictated a biographical sketch to a New York newspaper that is easy for you to find if you've just Googled Oxford or you can find it and read. His description of all the, he's one of the founders of, uh, from the point of view of a jockey of thoroughbred racing as we know it. Johnson then discussed tactics for the race with John Walden. Henry was growing a broad shouldered chestnut whose fourth birthday was coming in June. He was excitable in his youth. His legs were long with superb running action. He could sprint for a long time. An English commentator wrote that Henry was unquestionably the most beautiful horse on the eastern side of the Allegheny. On Monday afternoon, the crowds were growing, fans were lining up, New Yorkers were skipping work with many planning to spend the night at the course. The crowd was noisy and chaotic. Vendors were selling roasted pig and chickens. Northerners and Southerners together all exuberant over the approaching contest. And one of, uh, uh, at one of my talks, someone told me, you must also remember, it wasn't just the, the wealthy who participated because many people 
of all incomes level were placing bets on the race. That evening, a grand banquet was held with the main sponsors all present. The dinner featured fresh lobster from Long Island Sound, a special delicacy for the Southerners. Champagne toasts were offered for the love of the sport, but the joyous fete could not conceal the underlying sectional tension that animated the partisans on either side. Then late that evening, the unthinkable occurred. William Ransom Johnson, the Napoleon of the turf, became seriously ill from eating the Long Island lobsters. By sunrise, he was confined to his bed, unable to move. The Napoleon of the turf, the master strategist, would be unable to attend and would not command the Southern horse and rider for this greatest of all races. The sun rose hot on May 27. The roads from New York to the Union course were a teeming mass of riders, carriages, and struggling pedestrians. Eventually, 60,000 spectators assembled, creating the greatest gathering ever to assemble for a sporting event in the history of the country. They jostled through the gates to the board fence surrounding the track. All the way around the course, between the fence and the oval, they crushed together to catch a glimpse of the race. In the spacious infield, carriages and riders awaited the start. Many spectators had climbed trees, which groaned under the weight of those seeking a better view. In the crowd were many well-known people such as Andrew Jackson and Aaron Burr. This illustration is of a different race, but it does show you how the people would gather outside of the circle and in the infield with carriages and imagine 60,000 people on Long Island. Colors marked the jockeys in the competition. For the North on Eclipse, William Crafts wore a jacket and cap of crimson. Many spectators had hoped that he would be ridden by the older Samuel Purdy. At 38, Purdy was the leading Northern jockey who had frequently ridden Eclipse to victory. For the South, John Walden rode Henry, dressed in a sky blue jacket and cap. This race was also the first to be timed by an English split second chronometer, which was imported especially for the event. At the start, with the beat of a drum, the horse, horses left the stand like the wind. Henry, young and eager, took the lead. American Eclipse was ridden by Billy Crass at all 100 pounds. It soon became apparent that the young jockey could not control the great horse. As Henry took the lead and kept it, Crafts began to whip the Eclipse in panic desperation. Henry took the lead and kept it and finished the first heat in national record time of seven minutes, 37 seconds. Eclipse followed the winner with blood on his hind leg. And on this famous uh, tapestry, the first heat is at the top. The Southerners were jubilant. The Northerners were horrified in a panic. What was to be done? During the 30 minute rest period, the horses were bathed. Van Rance decided that Billy Crafts could not continue. He turned to the only possible choice, the experienced Samuel Purdy, who came forward from the crowd. Purdy then took off his court, coat to reveal his racing silks that he had worn all along in anticipation of being called forward at such a moment. He knew Eclipse well from many races. Henry had recovered from his record-breaking performance in the first heat. Eclipse had been bathed in his wounds salved. For the second heat, Henry took the inside position. At the start, Henry took the lead. This time, however, Purdy had a different strategy. Henry kept the lead for three miles. Purdy followed Henry closely for three miles and then made his move. At the end of three miles, the nose of Eclipse was almost at Henry's tail. 
In the first turn of the final mile, Eclipse was edging closer. At the center of the turn, Purdy pulled Eclipse leftward, leftward and inside of Henry. Eclipse struggled forward inch by inch, and then they were running neck and neck. Eclipse on the inside. In the straightaway, Eclipse broke away into the clear. Eclipse prevailed by two lengths with a time of seven minutes, 49 seconds. It was now the turn of the Southerners to panic. Their leader, William Ransom Johnson, confined to his bed, was still too Ill, Ill to be of any help. Without their master tactician, the Southerners were on their own. Led by Otwe Hare and John Randolph, they called on Johnson's experienced head trailer, Arthur Taylor, to ride Henry in the third and deciding heat. Soon the veteran jockey was dressed in Johnson blue. Purdy, knowing Eclipse as well as he did, was going to rely on his endurance to prevail over the younger Henry. With the sound of the drum, the third heat began. With both horses were weary. This time, Henry did not take the early lead. The younger horse carried the burden of exhaustion less well than, than did his older experienced cousin and rival. Purdy took a slight head start and took the lead. At three and three quarter miles, Henry was five yards behind. The young horse gave his best effort only to fall short. At the end of three miles, it was exhausted Eclipse by three lengths who took the third heat over exhausted Henry with a time of eight minutes and 24 seconds. The Northern crowd was jubilant. A messenger raced to William Nibbo's coffee house to raise the white flag. On sight of the banner, a brass band began to play and the celebrants began to sing a line from the well-known Judas Maccabeus by Handel. See the conquering hero comes, sound the trumpet, beat the drum. Lying in his sick bed, William Ransom Johnson, upon hearing in the distance the familiar words and melody, knew that the race for the South had been lost. In a speech to Congress, the eccentric John Randolph of Roanoke blamed the loss on the Northern lobsters. Without the wisdom and guidance of the ailing Johnson, in his words, it was not Eclipse, but lobsters that beat Henry. <laughs> Following the Civil War, the symbolism of the victory of American Eclipse was not lost on subsequent commentators. In 1881, Josiah Quincy of Massachusetts wrote, it was the first great contest between the North and the South, and one that seems to have foreshadowed the sterner conflict that occurred 40 years afterward. The sport of kings was in truth a drumbeat of coming war. Three horses, their houses, and the plantation landscape. Diamond, Sir Archie, and Henry shared a common life. They lived their lives as part of the plantation landscape and were attempted by, attended by grooms, trainers, and jockeys. They are a poignant reminder of the empty plantation landscape that we see today in the South. The great houses at Mount Airy and Mofield survive. Their architectural beauty remains and informs. Yet as you look at these houses in their present isolated splendor, there is a silence, a sense of a vanished community. Plantations were small villages inhabited by many people and marked by many surrounding structures. First, the people. The plantations were agricultural enterprises requiring land and labor. Most of the labor was not compensated and most of the plantation inhabitants were enslaved. The inhabitants lived in the main house and in the surrounding structures. They worked in the fields, worked in the houses, and a few worked with the horses. As you look at the modern landscape, the people are no longer there. Then the architecture. The great house was surrounded by a variety of smaller structures. Most slaves lived in separate cabins. 
Food was prepared in a separate kitchen. Meat was cured in smokehouses. Winter ice was preserved in brick ice houses. A necessary or privy fulfilled its essential function and the horses would have a stable. Many of these small supporting structures have crumbled away with the passage of time. As you travel in the Upper South and appreciate the architecture of beautiful federal and Greek revival houses dotting the landscape, to understand the history of the American thoroughbred, you must remember who and what are missing. Perhaps, perhaps your mind's eye could see long ago, ago horses being trained and cared for. And as you watch the Kentucky Derby, let your imagination inform what you see. As the jockeys race for advantage, look at their tactics and postures. As they race toward the finish, they're out of the saddle, hunched over to be aerodynamic. Think of the long ago jockeys, many African-American who over time perfected these techniques and tactics, creating a sport through experience, notwithstanding adversity. As the magnificent thoroughbreds race to the finish, think of their shared bloodlines, with so many from Seabiscuit to Secretariat, tracing back to Sir Archie and Diamond. And as a new champion is draped with a garland of roses, think of what William Faulkner who once wrote, the past isn't even past. Thank you very much. Does anybody have uh, any questions they'd like to ask on um, by pushing the chat button? Thank you, Jim, for that fascinating presentation, which sets the scene for the Kentucky Derby on Saturday. And thanks to all of you who participated. We hope to see you next time. Ah, here's a note from Bell to everyone. Fascinating talk. Absolutely. Thanks very much, everybody. Hope to see you next time.